And so today and always, let us keep our eyes on Jesus, who is the author and the perfecter of our faith. We're so glad you're here. Uh, we're so glad to worship Jesus with you. We're going to be in Matthew 2 today. It's going to be a great space for us to enjoy the presence of God. Let's worship God together.
that is like holy water on our skin. Mm. Would it be sweet? Would it taste sweet today, Lord? We are hungry for your word and thirsty for your spirit. As we sing this next song, it's talking about our belief for who God is, for who he is, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. challenge us to, to really look at these words, see the identities of Jesus, see the identities of God, and do we really believe that that's who he is? And if we do, do we trust him? Do we give our faith to him? Um, and if you do, I would challenge you to sing this out with us. i uh-huh. 
Isn't that good? I, uh, I got home last Sunday after speaking and being with you all, and one of the things that I said at the end of the sermon was uh, that we don't find God, that God came looking for us, and my friend MD sent me that short little song from Jason Upton, and it encouraged me so many times over this week. I told Spada on Thursday, I was like, we, I want to get that. I want to get that to uh, the church on Sunday, just as a little sermon bump to encourage you. So I hope that you found that helpful. I, I love the violin on that. I told Spade, I was like, if, any, if anybody plays a violin, we need to get a violin up here, because that is really, really uh, soothing. I am glad to be here with you today. Just um, being in this space and, and singing those songs with you encourages my uh, spirit this morning. And so I hope as we come to the message that your spirit will continue to be encouraged. Uh, we are in Matthew chapter 2 uh, today. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Matthew 2. We're going to be reading a number of verses uh, in Matthew 2. Uh, and uh, we'll get there in just a minute. But the series is called uh, King Jesus. And I've entitled the message today as Overjoyed. Mark, I don't have my clicker, so you, you, you and I will just be eyeing each other up there t uh, today. So one, one of the things that I am wanting to encourage us in is to uh, prepare for this time together 
uh, here on Sunday morning during the week so, so that you will be reading the chapter a few times, maybe even more than that before we get here, uh, if you choose to do that. And so uh, my encouragement today would be we're going to be in Matthew 3 next Sunday, or actually it'll be in two Sundays from now because next Sunday we're having our scattered event. But the next time that we're here is going to be Matthew 3, so you have an opportunity to read Matthew 3, study, dig, uh, grab things, and come ready for a Sunday morning. I thought it might be helpful to share with you some of my own process uh, that I do in preparation for our time together uh, here so that as you think about uh, preparing and studying and being in your own uh, personal study, that this might be an encouragement to you, might be a way that I could equip you even uh, as you prepare to come in on Sunday. So for me, so last Sunday afternoon, after we spent time in Matthew 1, I start listening, uh, reading uh, Matthew chapter 2. So from Sunday uh, afternoon all the way through Tuesday, my mindset around preparing for Matthew 2 today is read, 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 read. And I have that little Bible app, uh, and so sometimes I'll just connect that Bible app to my truck, and that guy that has that fancy voice, you know what I'm talking about, uh, I'll just have him read it to me in the truck. And the questions that I'm asking myself as I'm reading Matthew 2, uh, two questions, what are the themes what are the themes that I'm noticing as I read, read, read? And secondly, what are my questions? What are the themes that I'm reading and what are my questions? And then for my structure, my week, uh, Wednesday morning is my study morning. And so I get up, uh, I go to my office, and that whole morning is a study. And it goes from read, read, read to dig, dig, dig. And I am digging on Wednesday morning. And I use various commentaries that I like over the years. Uh, there's commentaries that I like. Uh, I'll go on wild rabbit chases and goose chases. I'll Google stuff. I'll look at things. I'll find this article. I'll read. Uh, I use a website called Bible Hub. Uh, it's a great website for me because it, it, it can connect you to a concordance called Strong's. And in the Strong's concordance, if I have a question about a word or a phrase, uh, I can see what the Greek of that word is and do some digging on that particular Greek word. And then I can look at all the other places in the New Testament where that particular word is. I can look at various translations of how tr translations do that work. And so it's just, I'm digging, I'm learning, I'm growing. I'm asking this question on Wednesday. As I'm digging, I'm asking, what is the text saying? That's the big question for me on Sunday morning. What is the text saying? What does this mean? The question I'm not asking on Wednesday morning is, what does this mean to me? I'm not asking that question because the reality is, it doesn't really matter necessarily what it means to me if what it means to me is different than what it actually means. And so that's kind of a popular question sometimes when we're in Bible studies, like, well, this is what it means to me, and this is what it means to me. And the reality is, it doesn't really matter what it means to you if what it means to you is totally different than what the text is saying and what does the text mean. And so we are asking the question, what does it mean? That's Wednesday morning. Uh, sometimes I will create an outline of the passage uh, if I'm ahead of myself. It usually doesn't happen until Friday. So after Wednesday morning, I close my study. Uh, I have a lot of appointments on Wednesday afternoons. Thursday is just a, an appointment day for me. And then Friday, the whole day for me, and that's a, it's a privilege to be a teaching pastor that I get to block a full work day to study and write. But... Um, if you think of me on Fridays, pray. Pray for me. If you think of me on Wednesday mornings, pray for me because I'm preparing and writing. But Friday morning is a writing day. I finish the sermon outline if I have started it. Uh, and then I'll begin to write uh, the message. Uh, and the questions that I'm asking on Friday is this. How is this relevant? How is this relevant to our lives here and now? Wednesday is what does this mean? Friday for me is, as I'm writing the messages, how is this relevant for our lives here now? I'm thinking about um, examples. I'm thinking about illustrations. How do I help teach to the body uh, what it means through the lens of how is this relevant for my life today? And so I'll spend literally the whole day uh, writing and preparing at the, at the end of the day. Uh, usually, sometimes this happens on Saturdays, but I will send uh, my sermon slides to Spada so that he can prepare those for us on Sunday morning. And I always send my sermon notes on Friday to my wife, Lindsay, for her review. 
I've said this before, you should know that oftentimes what's on my paper is both of us. Uh, And so I send my notes for her review and her feedback, uh, which is very helpful for me. And then on Saturday night for me, I'm tweaking and fine tuning. Typically, I have way more to say than I have time to say. And so the challenge for me is not coming up with things to say, it's fine tuning and coming up with what is, Lord, what are you saying to me to say to the body? And so I'm fine tuning, I'm trying my hardest to get my notes to no more than four pages. Because if I have four pages, I'm 40 minutes ish, ish. Uh, So I'm working really hard on fine tuning, tweaking. Uh, That's a few hours. And then on Sunday morning, I'm up really early and I'm in a coffee shop someplace and I'm reading my notes and I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. And then I get the chance to stand up here and teach. And so mainly I wanted to share this with you because I think sometimes we're like, well, I'm reading it, but what, what do I do after I read it? And I just want to encourage you, like, read, 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 and dig, 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 and ask yourself those questions. What are the themes that I'm seeing? What are the questions that I have? And do that study and come ready even on Sunday morning uh, with those questions and with those thoughts. And then dialogue with me during the week if you want to. Uh, I'm pretty quick at, a, uh, at an email response within a day. And uh, as long as it's not over the weekend, I take Mondays off, by the way, that's my Sabbath day. Uh, but I love to engage with people, questions that they're having, so you're welcome to engage with me on that. For this particular series, it's been really fun uh, with Matthew uh, because it's becoming a bit of a team approach in the notes and in the prep. Because in 1998, Lindsay and I were married in 1998, we have married 23 years. When we first got married, we lived in Franklin, Tennessee. And there was a BSF class that Lindsay got involved with with other women. If you don't know what BSF stands for, Bible Study Fellowship. Anybody ever do a Bible Study Fellowship class here? A few of us. Uh, She took a class the first year we were married on the Gospel of Matthew. And Lindsay was the one that was encouraging me to, to take our body through the Gospel of Matthew Uh, a few months ago after our Galatians series, and she said, I'm going to go back to all my notes from Matthew, and she still has her binder. And so what Lindsay is doing is she is going back through all of her notes, and she's writing notes on her notes, and then she's feeding me uh, prep notes before I study. So on Wednesday morning, I've got like four or five pages of notes from Lindsay already, kind of as a commentary from her BSF notes. And also a friend in our church, uh, Rachel Zimmerman, is going through BSF Matthew right now. And so she had mentioned that to me. I'm like, send me your thoughts, send me your thoughts. And so Rachel is sending me uh, her thoughts as well. Uh, Her husband, Colin's up top. He just raised the roof for his bride. You didn't see that, but I saw it. Um, And so Rachel and Lindsay and I, it's kind of a collaborative approach uh, for our study, which has been, which has been super fun. So anyway, I hope that equips, encourages you in some way. Here's the outline for our morning. Uh, And like last week, as we're going through this series chapter by chapter, um, when I, when I write the outlines, it's, it's not, it's, it's things that, that the Lord's showing me and that I feel stirred to share with you. Not all of these things flow together. And so uh, the way this will flow today, it's four kind of mini sermons all tied together. But I'm going to share with you the kind of the two themes that jumped out to me in Matthew 2. We're going to look at Joseph specifically and how he interacted uh, with the Advent, the first Advent story of Jesus as his adoptive father. We're going to do some comparison between Moses and Jesus, which will be super fun. We'll spend most of our time at the end, examples of the response of Christ uh, in the story. And so these are the themes um, that I want to share. So first point, Matthew 2 themes. Uh, Two themes that jumped out to me uh, as I was reading, 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 right? I'm reading, I'm reading. What are the themes? What are the questions? Uh, Two things that jumped off the page to me right away uh, was these four cities in in Matthew 2 that fulfill four prophecies, So we have four cities in the text, in the chapter, Bethlehem, Jerusalem, Nazareth, and Egypt. And four cities, all four cities in Matthew 2 fulfill Old Testament prophecy. So uh, just some interaction time here, since this is week three, uh, question for you. Why, Why do you think it is important for Matthew to talk about these prophecies being fulfilled in Jesus? Why is that important for Matthew? 
Jewish audience, Jewish audience, right? Matthew's purpose is to write a gospel narrative to convince his Jewish people that Jesus is Messiah. And so he is going to look for lots of opportunity throughout the whole gospel to make sure that his readers are understanding over and over and over again, Jesus is fulfillment of prophetic prophecy because of his purpose. He's the most Jewish of all of the four gospels. And more than any of the other four gospels, he links Old Testament prophecies. You could, you, you could do this. If you want to go to every single page of Matthew in your gospel and look for the word fulfillment, it is literally, that word is literally on almost every single page in the whole gospel of Matthew, fulfillment, fulfillment, fulfillment. So that, that's a theme. That's a theme for me as we see these four prophecies and four cities. The other thing for me that jumps off the page in Matthew 2 is supernatural breakthrough. It is supernatural breakthrough. We saw this in Matthew chapter 1. We just sang about it. I believe in the virgin birth. We just sang a song. That's a declaration. That's a supernatural truth of the life of the Messiah is that he came through the virgin Mary. That is supernatural. Here's some things in Matthew 2 for us. A moving star from the east. These Magi, or three wise men. Uh, have you always heard that pronounced magi? Has anybody ever heard it pronounced magi? Well, that fancy guy on the Bible app, you know that, you know, that fancy voice guy? Uh, in fact, let's have some fun with this. <laughs> We're going to do this. Listen to this. This was something else that happened this week. Check this out. Let's see if this works here. You got to just hang in there with me because I was like, what? All right, hold on, hold on. Matthew 2, here we go. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked. Did you guys hear that? He said Magi. How many of you in this room have ever said Magi? I was like, whoa, Magi. Okay. Anyway, I'm just saying, I'm not, I don't know. I just think, I mean, he probably knows more than I know. I mean, his voice is fantastic. Uh, but these magi, they followed this moving star from the east. Hear this. Science cannot explain this. Science cannot explain it. It moved the magi. I'm going to say magi now. Uh, to Jerusalem. They had an interaction with Herod. And then it moved from Jerusalem three miles south to Bethlehem. And they followed the star, and the star rested over Bethlehem where Jesus was born. And the text gives every indication that this star was a supernatural phenomenon. So that's one thing in Matthew 2. Supernatural. We had the virgin birth in Matthew 1. We have a moving star, you guys in Matthew 2, and also in Matthew 2, God is speaking to the Magi and to Joseph through dreams. When you read the chapter, it happens to the Magi once, and a supernatural dream happens to Joseph three times as you read it. I just want to read two verses. Uh, if you have your Bible open, this is Matthew 2, verses 12 and uh, 13. So supernatural breakthrough here. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they, the Magi, they returned to their own country by another route. So the Magi are being warned in a dream not to go back to Herod. And then verse 13, and when they had gone, uh, the Magi, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. And I just think it's important for us to hold virgin birth, moving star, God speaking supernaturally through dreams. It's important for us to hold these supernatural realities in our faith. Uh, and if our faith if our Christian faith can't allow for miracles and for 
supernatural breakthrough. And for with God, all things are, tell me, possible. If our faith can't hold the miraculous, we're not going to be able to embrace the story of Jesus the Messiah. We have to allow our finite minds to trust in God, to move beyond the natural into the supernatural. The Advent story is in miracle territory. And Joseph, Joseph embraced it over and over and over. Second point of the morning, I want to look at Joseph's trust in God. This is something that I learned this week that had never uh, really paid attention to before. And Rachel is the one that pointed it out to me. And I don't, she learned it from someone. She passed it to me. I learned it. Oh, my gosh, this is really amazing. I've never seen this before, and I am passing it on to you. So look at a few verses. I'm going to just kind of be all over the place in Matthew today. Um, let me remind you of what Joseph did at the end of Matthew chapter 1. These are the last two verses in Matthew 1, uh, verse 24. Then Joseph woke up, and he did what the angel of the Lord commanded him, and he took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. So there's an example of Joseph's trust in God. Look at verse 14 in Matthew 2 in your Bible. Joseph again. So he got up, he took the child and his mother. He had just been warned in the dream uh, to escape to Egypt, right? Verse 13. Verse 14, so he got up, he took the child and his mother during the night, and he left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. Um, verse 19 and 21. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel for those who were trying to take the child's life for dead. Verse 21, so he, Joseph, so he got up, he took the child and his mother, and he went to the land of Israel. He gets the word from the Lord, he gets the command from the Lord, and he does what the Lord commands him to do. Here's another example. Keep reading verse 22. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he, Joseph, was afraid to go there. And having been warned in a dream, supernatural download, having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So we have all these examples of supernatural breakthrough, uh, God speaking to Joseph in dreams and visions. And what did, what did Joseph do every time the Lord commanded him to do something? He obeyed. He did what the Lord commanded him to do. And hear this. This wasn't light and fluffy obedience. This was hard, gritty obedience. He had taken his wife from their town all the way down to Jerusalem for that census. That's a hard journey with a nine-month pregnant wife. They're in, they're in Bethlehem in a cave probably. He gives, Mary gives birth to Jesus. Then he's got to go to Egypt. You remember how long it took Israel to get to the promised land from Egypt? A long time. And Joseph's going to take his wife and a newborn Jesus all the way. This is hard obedience. This is gritty obedience. This is faith in God over fear. This is faith in God over my circumstances. He trusted God and therefore he obeyed. We talked about this in our uh, Untangling Legalism series. To trust God is to obey. It's con and it's connected to love. He believed and knew that God loved him. He trusted God, and so he obeyed. Have you ever noticed in this narrative, Joseph never speaks? There's never a word of Joseph in Matthew 1 or 2 in the whole narrative. He doesn't say anything. All we get, all we get are his actions. When God told him to take Mary as his wife, he obeyed. 
When God told him to name his child Jesus, he obeyed. When God said to flee to Egypt, he obeyed. When God said he could return, he obeyed. All we know about Joseph are his actions. I just find that interesting. I've never seen that before. I've never paid attention to that before. All we see are his actions. Some would say that our actions speak louder than our words. You want to know what I believe? Watch my life more than you listen to my words. If I want to know what you believe, I'll watch your life more than I'll listen to your words because our actions tell us what's core to us. What if people, here's a question to ponder in your life for me, for us, what if all people knew about us were our actions? What if all they knew about us was our actions? What would it say? What would it say about what we actually believe? Something to ponder. We see supernatural reality of God speaking to Joseph in dreams over and over and over in our text. I believe that God still speaks this way. I'm not saying that God's going to supernaturally speak to you in a dream this week. Maybe, maybe. But what I do know is that God speaks supernaturally to us in his word anytime we want to open the word of God. Anytime we want to hear what God is saying to us, we have a supernatural word of God for us to open. God is always speaking. Do we trust in the love of God? Do we trust in God's word to listen and obey even, even when it's not easy? I think this is a significant thing to Consider in Matthew 2 the life of Joseph and how he trusted God and obeyed. A third point, uh, Jesus is greater than Moses. Uh, in, this, in this story, Moses actually isn't mentioned, but there's a lot of similarity that we can connect in Matthew 2 from Moses and Jesus. And Jesus has greater glory than Moses. Um, Moses, again, isn't mentioned. Um, but as Matthew is building his case that Jesus is Messiah, he is building his case that Jesus is greater than Moses, that the new covenant of grace in the Messiah Jesus supersedes the old covenant law. Jewish people were under the old covenant of law, which was given to them by Moses. And so in this passionate gospel narrative that Matthew is seeking to convince Jews that Jesus is Messiah, he needs to convince him that Jesus has greater glory than Moses. That's what Hebrew 3.3 3 says to us. Literally, from the text, Jesus has been found worthy of greater honor than Moses. Jesus supersedes Moses. Here are some comparisons that Matthew gives us from Matthew 2. So we think, of the, we think of the story of Moses. Moses had to be hidden and protected from mass murder of Jewish babies in Egypt, right? The very beginning, his mom hid him, put, put, put him in the basket, right, and hid him, right? Because there was a mass murder happening in Egypt. And so Moses had to be hidden and protected from mass murder. When we read Matthew 2, Herod trips out. He trips out on the the Magi coming from the east. And what does he do? He orders that all male babies two and under be killed. So also Jesus had to flee to Egypt with his parents to be hidden during a mass murder of Jewish babies by Herod. So that's that's one commonality if you've never made that connection. Uh, Second connection Both Moses and Jesus came out of Egypt to the promised land, right? Jesus goes, he goes with Joseph and Mary to Egypt for a time until an angel told Joseph to take take him back to, to, to Israel. So we have a reality that both Moses and Jesus left Egypt to go to the promised land, Moses was leading enslaved Israel out of Egypt to freedom. Jesus was leading Israel out of being enslaved to the old covenant law. Moses said to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, let my people go so that they may serve me. 
That was the statement that Moses made to Pharaoh over and over and over. All the ten plagues, right? If you go back and read the story in Exodus. Let my people go. Jesus, Luke 4, in his hometown of Nazareth, opens um, Isaiah. And he says, he reads the passage. And the passage says, God has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. And this is being fulfilled in your hearing. Here's the connect. Whether it's Moses or Jesus, both realities, it's about freeing captives. Both realities is about freeing captives. It's always about liberating captives and setting people free with God. There's a verse that I want to uh, connect before the next point. John 1.17. Uh, our vision verse for our church is John 1.16. From the fullness of God, we have all received grace upon grace. Right? It's our vision. Two rivers church, the river of grace, the river of grace. The very next verse is this. The Apostle John says, John 1, 17, for the law was given through Moses. He was still about liberating captives from enslavement to the Pharaoh, to the promised land. But the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The freedom that Jesus brings is to be liberated from the, from the prison, the captivity of the old covenant law into the new covenant of grace. Jesus is greater uh, than Moses. As Hebrews again says, he has more glory. Now, um, we'll finish here. Examples of response to Christ. Uh, two, two specific responses to the birth of Christ in Matthew 2 that I want to point out. We see Herod's rejection, his flat-out rejection of Jesus uh, as the Messiah. And then we see this example of the three wise men, the, the Magi, or maybe you'll say with me now, the Magi. That might be what you grab. Hopefully that's not the only thing you grab onto from today. But t- here is Herod rejection. I mean, let me tell you a little bit about who Herod was. Uh, Herod in Matthew 2 was the legal ruler over Jerusalem, over Israel, over Israel by Rome. Rome empowered Herod to be the legal ruler over Israel. And so he was given the title King of the Jews. Right? That was his title that he was given by the Roman Senate. And he loved, I mean, he loved that title. He loved the title given to him by the Roman Senate. I'm the King of the Jews. He had been in power for four decades when Jesus was born. Forty years of like... I am A1 in charge. You do what I say, when I say, how I say, when I say. 40 years. Here's the thing about Herod. Most of us don't realize he was a half Jew. And he was a professed converter. Like he was, oh, I'm Jewish. He was a pro- professed converter to Judaism. But here's the reality. He was oppressive to the Jews. And he was paranoid paranoid about his throne he had three sons and his wife and his own mother and others close to him put to death because he feared plots to overthrow him so before the birth of Jesus this is this is historic reality of of Herod three sons his wife his own mother and others close to him all put to death because he was afraid that they were developing plots to overthrow him because I'm the king of the Jews And so his flat-out rejection of Jesus and plots to kill him out of fear that Jesus, this baby, is going to threaten his position. What did the Magi say at the beginning of Matthew 2? Let's read this together. The first three verses of Matthew 2. Let's see what they say to Herod. Uh, Verses 1 through 3 in Matthew 2. So after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, During the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born? What does this say in your Bible? King of the Jews. Where's the one who? And he's like, I'm the king of the Jews. And these people have come from far away and they're priests and they have authority and they have wealth. And they're asking for the king of the Jews. And they say, we saw his star in the east, and we have come to worship, worship him. And then in Matthew, let's look at verse 16. 
uh, when Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious. And he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. In verse 3, it says, when King Herod heard that they were looking for the king of the Jews, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. I mean, he was freaking out. I think the word disturbed in the NIV is probably a little bit too soft in terms of uh, how he felt about uh, this priestly, these priestly people coming from the east looking for the king of the Jews. I would say that uh, enraged might be more accurate of where he, where he was. Um, all of Jerusalem, when it says all of Jerusalem was disturbed with him, probably meant religious leaders of that day in Jerusalem, all of whom were appointed by Herod. So they were enjoying their position too. And so when it says all of, all of the people that Herod had, had, had given authority to were also disturbed about uh, these uh, priests, these, these rich, wealthy people from the east that had come here. Here's something from history that uh, we don't know. We just see that Herod died in the text and that God sent an angel to tell Joseph he could go home. But here's what history tells us. Herod died almost immediately after the order for all of the children to be killed. The timeline was very short. The timeline was very short. Normally for kings like this, big kings like Herod, uh, historians would record a cause of death. But the only thing that is recorded about Herod's death in history books is simply this. It was Herod's evil curse. Interesting. It was Herod's evil curse curse to reject Christ. He rejected Christ. He murdered, murdered all of these young boys in Jerusalem and the vicinity because of his own fear and rage is to reject Christ. And the historians say it was his evil, evil curse. Um, so we have his great rejection and his death. And then we also see this reaction to Jesus in the story. We see the Magi's worship. We see them worship. These are the, the two reactions that I want to juxtapose, juxtapose for us this morning. Here's the reality about the Gentile, the, the Gentile wise men. First, they were Gentiles from the East. They were not Jewish. Most scholars believe they were from Persia or possibly even from Babylon. They were not kings, but they certainly were men of prominence. They were wise men. Most scholars say they were most likely wise men priests from their land. They were teachers of Persian kings, and they were skilled in science and philosophy, and they were known for their wisdom. They probably had very limited or no scriptural knowledge whatsoever. Uh, some, some of the commentaries that I read this week, scholars believe that they may have been familiar with uh, Daniel's prophecy from the Old Testament, story of Daniel, some of that prophetic timeline. Maybe they were somewhat familiar with that, or perhaps a prophecy from Numbers chapter 2, this, this prophecy of a star of Jacob. Uh, maybe they were, from, were familiar with that, but we don't really know. The reality is they probably had limited uh, or no scriptural knowledge. Here's some misconceptions about the wise men before we look at how they responded. How many were there? Were there? We think three because of the gifts, right? You know the gifts. This is the Christmas story. Gold, hang a sense, myrrh, right? It was probably an entourage. I mean, they were prominent, important people in their land. Three prominent, important people that aren't going to come literally over 900, maybe 1,000 miles in that day without an entourage of people. There was a lot of people that showed up in Jerusalem, a substantial number of people. Here's another misconception, that they found Jesus as a newborn on the night of his birth. Isn't that what you lay out on your nativity scenes in Christmas, right? How old were the young boys that Herod slaughtered 
in the story from what age down? Two years. Based on the timeline that the Magi told him. So I've had some fun with this in years past uh, in a, in, on, a, on a Christmas Eve night. Uh, we're doing Christmas in October right here. It's totally fine. It's all good. You don't have to worry about that. Um, here's the reality. Uh, in the text, look what it says in verse 11 when they got to Jesus. It says, on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Was Jesus born in a house? No. He was born in a stable, most likely a cave. Two years and younger. I think this is possible. I mean, a two-year-old kid is walking around, talking a little bit. Jesus may have even answered the door. I don't have any idea. Like, what's up, bros? I mean, he probably wouldn't have said that. But the reality is he wasn't a newborn infant. It was somewhere within two years at his house. And then Matthew 2, 5, and 6 in the story, it says, um, in Bethlehem in Judea is where the Magi replied, for this is what the prophet has written, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, this is where Jesus was born, are by no means least among the rulers of Judea, of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel, to which I say, well, of course it's, of course it's Bethlehem where Jesus was born. Um, of course that's where they went because that's what the prophet Micah said. That's what the prophecy said. Uh, one of the commentators I read this week said, the reality that Jesus was born in Bethlehem is as, I'm going to quote this, as close to a straightforward prediction fulfillment as is found anywhere in Matthew. The reality that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, which is exactly what the prophet Micah said would happen. Um, and so after months and months uh, traveling over a thousand miles, they were about to see the Son of God. Can you imagine, can you imagine their anticipation? Can you consider for a moment uh, what the emotions they may have been feeling when they got there? Uh, let's read this part of the story. Verse 7, then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go worship him. Yeah, right. Verse 9, after they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. They were overjoyed. And on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and they worshiped him. And they opened their treasures, and they presented him with gifts of gold, of incense, and of myrrh. And of having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. They were overjoyed. They, think about this for a second, prominent, prominent priests, men of wisdom, high positions of authority, see this child, and they got, and they bowed down, and they worshiped, and they brought, they brought their treasures to him, gold, Ever think, think about the significance of the gifts? Gold was suited for a king. The gift of gold suited for a king. Frankincense was used in the worship of God. The deity of Christ and the worship of God was frankincense. And myrrh was used at death to preserve a person's body. This is a prophetic proclamation of the deity of Christ and the humanity of Christ and the forthcoming sacrifice of Christ for our sins. It's also interesting to think about how poor Joseph and Mary were. How did they survive in Egypt? How do you think they survived? How do you think they sustained themselves with gifts of gold and frankincense 
and Mary. Also, I think Joseph was a baller. I think he was, I think he took care of his family. I think he figured it out. He was a carpenter. I think he got gritty. I think he provided for his family. But God had provided for them on the front end as, as well. Question for you. What do you do when you're overjoyed? Like, what happens? Like that moment when you just, you literally can't contain the joy. Do you lose yourself a little bit? When like you're overjoyed, like do you, do you lose yourself? Do you stop thinking about what someone else around you might think about you? You kind of lose yourself. You kind of stop caring a little bit about that. Am I right? Is that just me? Think about for you parents in the room, right? When you're, when you're in that little five-year-old like youth soccer and it's, it's terrible to watch. <laughs> I mean, it's, but your kid somehow, some way kicks that ball in that net. And what do you do as a parent? You lose yourself. You lose yourself a little bit. A recital. A recital. A, bro- a Broncos game? Anyone? Anyone lose yourself a little bit at a Broncos game? Maybe. Probably. Yeah, not right now. They've lost four in a row. It's not, not ideal, an illustration for me. Here's the point I'm trying to make. When you feel a sense of being overjoyed, you lose yourself a little bit. And I think that's a good thing. Here's my question to ask you. Can you say that's true of your worship? And I'm not, I'm not talking about when we're just corporately gathered here singing songs, right? Um, my dad loves God. And he would be real comfortable in these wooden pews. And he would sing he will never raise a hand, and that's totally fine. My mom, she's just the opposite. So it's not, it's not about formula. It's, I'm, just, I'm just asking the question. It's not about even singing. Uh, it's about do, do you say, do you have a sense of being overjoyed when you worship, not just singing, but also loving people, serving people? Because when we are worshiping and we're overjoyed, whether we're singing, loving, or serving, we are losing ourselves a little bit. We are losing ourselves a little bit, which I think is a wonderful, wonderful reality for us. Uh, Here's a scene. I'll close here. Worship team, you can come back up. Scene in 2 Samuel 6. Go read this later. King David leading the procession to the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. And it was a celebration because the Ark of the Covenant in the Old Covenant era was the very presence of God. And they were bringing the Ark back. The story again, 2 Samuel 6, verse 5. David and all of the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with songs of lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. Verse 14. And David... What did he do before the Lord with all of his might? It says he danced. I don't know if he danced like this. I have no idea. But he danced before the Lord with all of his might. But his celebration was offensive. Do you remember? If you know the story, who was his celebration offensive to? Anyone know? His wife, Michael who was a daughter of the previous king. And she judged him for it. She wanted to settle him down. Don't be so overjoyed. You need to act more dignified. And he said to her, I will celebrate before the Lord. He said, I will be even more undignified than this. And then he said these words, I will be humble in my own sight. Isn't that a beautiful statement? I will be humble in my own sight. C.S. Lewis says that humility isn't thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. That's the gift of humility. Humility is the way. Humility is the way. And pride leads to destruction. The humility of the Magi to bow down and worship and bring gifts. They were overjoyed. They lost themselves. And the pride of Herod that leads to destruction. Humility receives the glory of Jesus and worships. 
when we get so caught up in love and wonder that we forget what others might think of us, we throw ourselves into God's pleasure. I'm gonna read that again, and then we're gonna worship. When we get so caught up in love and wonder that we forget what others might think of us, we throw ourselves into God's pleasure. Bethlehem, insignificant town. Nazareth was so insignificant, it wasn't even included in maps at the time. These towns transform from insignificant to significant, but not just towns, people, people, me, you, us, us. You have value, you are pursued, you are loved. Jesus came for you so that you would know that you have a rescuer and his name is Jesus. Let us worship him again this morning.
give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. And great are you, Lord. It's your
the earth, in all the earth, will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, and these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. One more time, all the earth, in all the earth, will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing, great are you, Lord. It is your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out thinking of a uh, scene at a, a youth camp back in the 90s, all the way back. It's the camp that Lindsay and I met at, and they, we used to do this chant, and it was based on the word joy. And all the kids would get up and chant, and J is for Jesus, O is for others, Y, I, 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 I is for you, you. And I was like, that's right. And I think the word that the Lord just gave me to give to you is don't don't be afraid of being overjoyed. You'll taste something fresh and new. Don't be afraid. Like when we get overjoyed, we lose ourselves a little bit. And humility, humility is the way. So be encouraged uh, today. Uh, Next week, we will not be here We're going to be scattering. It's a fifth Sunday all over the community. Uh, There's one thing on there, house yard work. Uh, Look on the the website and the newsletter this week. We'll get a time and location. There's probably going to be a few different house yard cleanup projects we're hoping to get. Uh, But there's lots of opportunities for you to worship. Lose yourself in worship by serving others. Uh, Next week, uh, our Scatter Sunday, not regular services. Uh, We're going to have one more family meeting about the future of our church two Sundays from today after service. So if you haven't been to one of the family meetings yet, we'd love to have you come to one of those two weeks from today after a second service. We'd love for you to be there for that. And then lastly, if you're new at Two Rivers, uh, we have a Get Connected partnership class on the 14th. So um, on your way out, say hello, meet someone. There's giving boxes in the back if... uh, Uh, Giving and worship is part of how you want to engage today. There's coffee out in the lobby. I hope you have a great day. You are blessed and dismissed. Thank you for being here.